to that, people may be eligible for that. But right now, we also have to implement our laws uh, at the border. We also want to protect people, both in that community, but also migrants. One of the challenges, as we're all facing a pandemic here, is the gathering of so many people. We're still implementing Title 42, which means that we are going to send people out of the country who come in uh, as we implement that. A, a COVID safety protocol. Exactly. But d did you say that it's possible that that extension that applies to Haitians already here could apply to those coming across the border Well, now. Tony, it's already been extended uh, because of the turmoil on the ground. It was earlier this summer. That's something that the Secretary of Homeland Security and Secretary of State do look into. But again, as we look to the, the, the photos, uh, not just the ones you referenced, but, but of all of these families and people under the bridges, we wanted to also take steps to implement our laws and to protect a lot of them from the spread of COVID as well. <laughs> All right, welcome, folks. Left to Reckoning, episode 37. Blockchain, smart contracts, and false promise. I'm Matt Leck. With me, David Griscom. Hey, David. Hey, brother. Law and order. You're hearing it right there from the Biden administration. <laughs> yeah. Law and order, don't we, folks? Well, speaking of false promise, let's get right to uh, Joe Biden. Uh, and his administration, who uh, Joe, remember, ran against white supremacy and uh, and also to follow science, which is why we have this Title 42, which is uh, very helpfully that Sorry, my, uh, ring light was getting my eye there a little bit. Um, very helpfully, uh, Title 42 uses COVID um, flim flam about keeping people safe from a virus uh, to keep out immigrants mm -hmm. and uh yeah, and the, it's really galling. We, we talk a lot about how much uh, Jen Psaki is not your friend. You shouldn't celebrate her, even if she dunks on like a Fox News uh, anchor's son, who's now a, a White House reporter. Um, but that, speaking out of two sides of her mouth with regards to you're doing this to keep them safe, or is it because they're disease-laden immigrants, a la exactly what Stephen Miller was arguing, that mm -hmm. you supposedly ran against? But of course, uh, I think the useful thing, again, about having Democrats in power is that they have to own the stuff, and they can't just fundraise lacrimosely off of it um, when Trump does it. But uh, it's very frustrating. Um, I don't know if you have anything you want to say. I, I watched Tucker Carlson, uh, not as I usually do, on the Twitter feed as people post the most objectionable things he says, but actually live last night, and he had a Chiron on that said, nobody can defend this. And that is interesting enough. I mean, you'd be surprised how much Biden supporters can defend it. They blame it all on Trump, right? Trump put us in this position to force our hand. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what Trump actually does um, owe to this, but it's all pantomime. It's all, as they say, kayfabe, a favorite word, because Biden's giving them exactly what we want. There's, there's a story now before we came on air that Biden is going to uh, reopen Guantanamo. He's looking for contractors to speak yeah. Creole uh, so that they can open a detention center for Haitian refugees instead of processing them like refugees and, and also just helping them settle in this country. Um, it's really, uh, it's, it's really galling for me because Tucker Carlson, everyone's pissing on Joe Biden, right? Rightfully so. But this thing where Tucker says no one can defend this, and then what he wants is not to let Haitians in and not to normalize a process where we allow these people to settle in and, you know, even just hear out their claims of, uh, for refugee status. Instead, he wants us to lean on Mexico to stop them in the water before they get to land, basically. And essentially, Biden's done something similar to that. So they're all getting basically what they want. And what we need to get to somehow is a not only like a uh, uh, revocation of Title 42 and an understanding of what it was, the cynical, racist, sort of white nationalist fence of a policy, a wall mm -hmm. of a policy that it was, and affirmatively just welcome people to this country. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot to, to talk about. I think maybe in a little bit we'll get to the, the striking images. But like, let's let's start with top line. What people should understand here is that 
as, as you were saying, Matt, it's like, yeah, it's amazing to see how much this becomes, you know, sorry to use a cliche term like a political football, right, for each side to sort of point at the other. And Matt's right to point out here that what Tucker Carlson is arguing for, what the right wing is arguing for is not some kind of humanitarian policy, but an even more extreme and, and, and brutal one. Um, you know, a lot of it's political theater because this one is pretty close to as brutal as it can get. I mean, the, image that, the images that we've gotten are, are, are striking, um, but these things don't happen in isolation. Um, and just to give some people some context as to what's happening, you know, the majority of these Haitian migrants are folks who were displaced in 2010, right? Um, people who, because of massive purposeful disinvestment in Haiti, massive personal, um, you know, purposeful corruption within the government in Haiti because the United States was trying to make sure that any kind of left alternative did not come into power because they wanted to use the island um, as a place for cheap labor. Yeah, to make Levi's. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, like that creates a crisis in a, in a society um, that has caused mass displacement, right? You see the, the earthquake, right? Obviously, that's a natural disaster. But the other side of the natural disaster is when these things become, you know, man-made. So, you know, basically these folks who have been displaced for a very long time are trying to get into the United States because they're thinking and they're buying into the me media narrative that, oh, well, the, the bad man's gone, Trump's gone, and now they're going to be met with a humanitarian policy at the border, uh, which, which they, they have not been. And, you know, so like that's the kind of historical reason as to why, you know, this, this large group of, of migrants are there. Um, but there's two things that really need to be noted. What is Title 42? Um, for people who are not familiar, this was something that was put in place by Donald Trump. Um, on at first on the advice and pressure of Stephen Miller, remember that nasty ghoul, um, as a way to get around um, typical international law when it comes to processing um, and accepting asylum seekers. Notice so, Jen Psaki said our laws, not international law. <laughs> very, yeah, exactly. Um, laws that were all too willing to, you know, the United States loves international law. Uh, when they can sort of throw it at their enemies and use it to sort of beat the chest and to talk about, you know, land invasions of Cuba. Um, but when it comes to actually, you know, owning up and, and, and living up to those standards, um, yeah, it's all about uh, the good old USA, right? And our laws. But listen, like, understand this. Like, so Title 42 is something that Stephen Miller's trying to use to circumvent international law uh, in relation to asylum seekers. And what is Title 42 specifically? It is basically saying that in the interest of the public health, um, you can deny people um, the right to asylum or the right to enter the country, um, you know, to basically prevent a pandemic. Now, it should be noted that when Stephen Miller was pushing this, it was before COVID-19, before the COVID-19 pandemic. And rather, he was trying um, to, to cite, you know, some small outbreaks of mumps uh, amongst, you know, migrant communities as they were headed to the U.S. border. Of course, um, you know, the, the coronavirus became a, a, a perfect opportunity for Trump um, to basically put in on a large scale that policy. And that became a hardening of, of the border, border that was already militarized and hard in the first place um, under Trump. Notably, and this is the reason that, um, you know, progressives in the left and fuck, even Democrats, even just like typical centrist Democrats should be pissed about this. If you went out and you voted for Biden to, you know, stop putting kids in cages to stop the, the horrible images that you were seeing on our border, um, this is a complete slap in the face. Uh, because not only are these policies continuing, but, you know, the Biden administration is advocating in court um, for them not to be overturned. So when we're talking about Title 42, we're talking about something that, yes, has a, uh, you know, its origins within the Trump administration, but it's not one of these things that's just like, oh, it just fell upon Biden, right? And it's right. like, oh, he's trying everything he can do to you know, eradicate it. No, he's he wants to be able to use it. And you're seeing it from the less, the messaging of Saki and from uh, the uh, DHS. That's the really key point. This is a Key, uh, this is a choice. The Democrat leadership has basically decided that they are going to be one of the people who really takes notice of Stephen Miller's Twitter feed these days. Mm -hmm. And they follow basically and they'll give those people exactly what they want. Like this is policy. This is a conscious choice. And that's why it's so when Biden says like, yeah, because Charlottesville and all this shit, like, dude. You're doing it like Joe Biden is doing it. And so this is a great. This is what the message should be for like 
the complicity in the Democratic Party in this sort of white supremacist policy, basically. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, this is this is the thing is like there's there's like a mosaic of of issues and and and, and history to sort of like. I don't know, untangle here, right? And that might be a tortured metaphor, but you know what I'm trying to say, mm -hmm. right? There's a lot of different factors at, at, at play, right? One is like the big political theater, right? And the big political theater is like, oh my God, um, you know, Greg Abbott and the Republicans are attacking Trump for his weak border policy, right? And Biden is very happy, honestly, I would imagine to accept- They're attacking Biden for his- Criticisms, we, sorry? You see, you said attacking Trump, you meant attacking Biden for the- Oh yeah, excuse me, yeah, sorry. Attacking Biden- um, and, you know, Biden is very happy to like receive some of those criticisms because it makes it seem like he's doing everything that he can. And it is like the mean and cruel Republicans. Yeah, who are good point. It's exactly like open borders, Joe, because Hannity now is saying some Haitians are being resettled, like some are getting squeaking through the cracks. Like it's just really revolting stuff. And Biden, of like you said, that is that, that, that there's they're scratching each other's back with that. Yeah, I, no doubt about it. And like, you know. Uh, the the images of of the you know DHS agents on horseback um, around around the migrants are, are horrifying, and so is what Abbott has done, um, which is basically build a wall of like SUVs on the border. Um, which, if you wanted any kind of like metaphor for like the piggishness of this country, it's a it's a wall of uh, you know suburbans. <laughs> I, unbelievable! I'm, let's see if I can find some photos of that. Um... But while, you know, I mean, while you're yeah. pulling it up, I mean, the thing is, though, is that like, again, like, you know, so there's that kind of like theater that that's what the people who are just gobbling up Fox News and MSNBC are getting two different hues of, of that fight. Um, but again, it's it's a false it's a false struggle. And we'll get into some of these things later that like, you know, in fact, Biden um, has, has ramped up a lot of these anti-immigrant uh, policies. And there's a really good call to action that we'll get to in a second. But I also wanted to make sure that we're noting regarding Gitmo, um, not only is that just a disgusting uh, uh, concept, right? Just a, as a metaphor, right? To be bringing in people whose country has been destroyed through neoliberalism, um, the IMF, and particularly the United States State Department, um, you know, are trying to, to flee, but also that, uh, yeah, and you can see those those images there of the uh, of of the cars. It's just absolutely horrific. And and Gitmo, obviously, like you can imagine why it'd be horrific. But people should also remember that there's a history of Haitians being brought to Gitmo. George H. W. Bush um, was doing a similar thing when Haitians were fleeing um, via boat to come into the United States. Um, and people who were held in Gitmo was specifically on the um, the assumption, right, or the, the reasoning for it was that they might have HIV AIDS. And those conditions that people were held in were absolutely subhuman. Um, they are a disgusting stain on, on this country. Uh, and just the uh, thought of bringing anybody there, let alone Haitians who have already you know, felt the effects of what a United States refugee camp looks like um, in, in Gitmo is absolutely despicable for anyone to do, let alone somebody who was, again, running on sort of ending the barbaric policies of Donald Trump. So the um, the way that we get into pedantry in these sorts of topics, too, is very dark. Yeah. The whole uh, it wasn't a whip. It was a rein that they were using to lash people while on horseback. It, it's exact same thing as is it a concentration camp? Isn't it? Isn't it? What is technically a concentration camp? Like really pe a retreat to pedantry to basically um, make this that kind of a word game instead of what this is which is mass brutality and just cruelty towards people who are looking for something that we should be able to provide them you know drop the reins from the picture like you photoshop that out of there yeah. right and that picture is still horrifying of course you get what i'm saying right it's like uh you know i don't want to digress too much it's like yeah, I, I, th I think your point on, on Twitter about that, that was 100% on, right? This is the most ridiculous thing to be trying to, you know, correct folks on. Yes, do I think that like the vast majority of Americans, um, spe specifically people who haven't grew grown up in like rural areas, understand like the fine aspects of like horsemanship or horse riding? Yeah. Yes. Do I think that this is the moment right now to try to push some insane lesson on folks to try again to, to throw cover over 
barbarism on the border. You Photoshop those reins out of there. So there's no question about people being whipped. And that photograph is exactly um, has the same kind of moral weight. It's people on the ground, scared, you know, trying to run well, and being met with a huge animal and a police officer on horseback, right? When they should be being met at the border with food, with clothing, um, and with tickets to places to go in the United States for them to be resettled and to be invited into uh, this community. We have enough space. Fuck, we have need and, and demand, um, you know, for, for working people in this country in the first place. Um, like, you know, we have plenty of, of space and opportunity for people in this country uh, that to be meeting 14,000 folk at the border like this. It's just absurd. Yeah. It's just beyond absurd on, a, on like a moral level, but even like on a really cynical, like nuts and bolts, like political economy level, we absolutely can be inviting people into this country and would frankly benefit um, from having uh, more Haitians, um, not just because of, uh, you know, I mean, for, for, for a million reasons, honestly. Yeah. I mean, I could keep going, uh, but I feel like I'll just get more and more angry, but yeah, let's well, let's do this because there's a call to action that we can do that I think is worthwhile. Right. If you don't mind pulling up this truth out piece, yeah. Um, and this was written actually before uh, a lot of these uh, images were coming out. The fights over, uh, not that the fight over forty two wasn't uh, going on beforehand, but you know they were uh, before it sort of had reached the head that it had. Um, this is in truth. That was an op ed. A number of immigrants detained by ICE has increased seventy percent under Biden. Just scroll down a little bit. Um, I want to get their name too. Um, this is by uh, Silky Shaw, um, who has been is a, one of the organizers of uh, Communities Not Cages. And we will put some links to people um, for how to participate. It's going to be an action that's going on in over 20 cities. Um, but this was written before, you know, a lot of this, this, this horrifying stuff um, was Biden and it, it rings even more True. Uh, the first line is when President Biden took office, the number of immigrants in federal custody was at a 20 year low. There was an opportunity to roll back the system, but Biden chose to maintain the status quo of previous administrations. Within a couple of months, jail beds started filling up again. Um, and then they talk about why they organized this this march. Um if you go down a little bit, Matt, there's a paragraph that starts with Joe Biden in office. There's a growing perception that immigration enforcement is less lethal, but the numbers tell a different story. Uh, the numbers of immigrants jailed by ICE has increased 70% since the start of the Biden administration. And we continue to lock up children, nearly 15,000 daily, um, in large scale facilities and military bases. And now we're talking about reopening uh, portions of Gitmo to hold people again. Uh, these conditions have been exacerbated by the pandemic. ICE has done little to keep COVID-19 at bay, spreading infections not only inside immigration jails, but also in surrounding communities into other countries through the deportation of thousands of immigrants. And that's, that's a really important point, yeah. honestly, that like, you know, the threat of COVID uh, from immigration um, is not from immigrants, but from the, 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 the damn uh, ICE agents themselves. Yeah, and also we stopped testing them as we uh, expelled them, uh, which even puts further to the lie Saki's bullshit about trying to keep everybody safe. And then there's, a, there's I mean, this, people should really check out this entire article because it's filled with a lot of, uh, you know, important facts here, but it's a little bit later in the piece that starts on the campaign trail. Um, on the campaign trail, uh, President Biden lamented the separation of families by Trump and committed to, quote, stop corporations from profiteering off of incarceration, which is an amazing um, thing to be pointing out again, as not only are they talking about reopening Gitmo, but as Matt mentioned, they are looking for private contractors um, to be providing much of the security, logistics, and translation services, right? So that's a complete walk back uh, from that policy. Just so people are, are clear, by the way, though, regarding Gitmo, it's something that the administration is exploring, and hopefully the, the political backlash that they've already seen yeah. uh, will prevent this from happening. But you should remember, that's where their heads are at. That's what their reaction is, yeah. regardless of if it comes to fruition or not. Um, early on, the administration rolled out reforms to limit deportations and undo uh, Trump's worst policies. But as the border has become a top news story and an easy target for right wing attacks, Biden has faltered. Meaningful progress toward dismantling immigration detention has effectively ground to a halt. The continued persistence of immigration detention, despite growing consensus um, that it's unnecessary and wasteful, shows 
how much easier it is to build up and expand the system and infrastructure than to roll it back. Um, and, you know, they go on to note some of the early things that seem to be very, uh, you know, beneficial. Um, but this is a call to action. This is a call to make sure that people are not, you know, ignoring what's going on. You're certainly seeing Democrats, typical Democrats being very happy to go on Twitter, honestly, um, and, and just see how people are responding to any of these stories of the horrors at, at the, the border. And you will not be able to tell the difference, frankly, between the typical Democratic suburban voter and a Republican. Um, it, they're saying things like, what would you want to do with them? Send them back. They're a threat to this country. We're full, right? And these are people who stand with her and we're very happy to, to vote for Joe. Absolutely. Um, this is one of those things where sometimes you can forget. I don't know. Like I talked about this yesterday during the stream on the left. It's like, sometimes there's a fixation where it's like, okay, well, do we have like all of the numbers to do everything that we need to do? You know, sometimes it's just <laughs> as important to be like leading and fighting these kind of battles and in, in, in conversation and making the demands, articulating them, and then having people come and join you rather than just hoping that organically, everybody's going to understand what's going on and sort of side with you. I am a hundred percent in agreement with that exact, the exact dynamic. It doesn't matter at this point about this sort of topic first of all and I, I mean even if it did you might be able to make an argument with uh, how welcoming um americans are about this stuff even despite constant propaganda about how fucking dangerous they are um but yeah like i think you're exactly right like that shit has to go out the window and like and, and it's also a way where like yeah I'm, no no i mean you're 100 right and maybe like you know i to sort of end this conversation, I think that, you know, we were talking about this a little bit beforehand. And again, we're not trying to get in flame wars with anybody. Um, so, you know, maybe we'll skip names, but like, there's a, like, Matt and I have no fears about, for example, tying Biden into these nasty um, kind of things, right? And I do think that there is a, a kind of cruel and bitter irony in the fact that the, you know, the kids in cage, the no more kids in cages camp in the Democratic Party become very silent once Biden comes into office. Yeah. But I do think that sometimes pe people on our side, we can become a little bit of poisoned by, you know, the fact that there's so much hypocrisy around this kind of stuff that you forget your like first and foremost moral duty, which is to be standing up for people against injustice anywhere, but particularly injustice done in your name. Um, and if your re only reaction uh, to these kind of horrors is just like, but what about Trump? Right. You know, just trying to own the libs. I think it might be time to walk back a little bit and, and, you know, um, and, and reassess, you know, if, if, you know, owning, owning the libs has gone to such a point where you're not able to just see the very clear moral picture here and to advocate and to look for avenues for something to do. Because like the fact is, is they are, they, you're hundred percent right. The Democrats aren't doing it. The liberals aren't doing newsflash it. us just sitting there and pointing at them for not doing it instead of trying to advocate um, for something different, or at least be critical on the merits of the plan instead of just pointing out the hypocrisy in general. Um, that's also a glaring mistake as well. Because I think it sort of naturalizes and excuses almost and defangs any sort of attempt at shaming them into doing anything remotely better. And I mean, if they don't open this Gitmo thing, it's obviously worse. And it's obviously like an example, of one of many, which surprise, when Biden won, it didn't mean that we were going to humanize the border. Uh, so yeah, like... And I think anybody who was selling, like, vote for Biden based on that, they should be shamed. And good, I, make time for that conversation. But that's not, like, the only reason to, like, have us, like, do that small thing on voting day, right? Like, and to always bring it back to that conversation, I don't think it's that interesting. Because I think, like, if Trump was in office right now, I'd be like, yeah, I like the guys on horseback. And then Joe Biden would be like, you mm -hmm. know, I, I wish I would have won and go to Joe 30330 and give us $25 a month. And next time we'll really get him. And it's like... Like, no, this I, I think the clarity is uh, somewhat useful, even if the cruelty is the same. Yeah, I think that's a hundred percent on point. And again, I just put it into the uh, notes on um, on Twitter. If you're watching this or listening to it, um, the uh, website is detentionwatchnetwork.org. I'll say that again: detentionwatchnetwork.org/slash/take-action. National Day of Action 2021. Probably be easier to just go to the homepage there. But on September 23rd, tomorrow, um, there are going to be actions all around the country. Um, and it might be useful to show up to those if you are able. Yeah. And take us if you uh, do do that. Yes, that'd be wonderful.
All right. Well, well yeah. On, that on another one that like, uh, I mean, we're heated about this and we're heated about this next subject. I'm really looking forward uh, to everybody's uh, reaction. I know we've doubled down on, on the Bitcoin stuff, um, but we knew and, and we're correct um, that almost immediately after Matt and I did our sort of takedown of, of Bitcoin or at least criticism of why people on the left shouldn't be supporting it. Um, we were going to get, you know, people saying, oh, you don't understand the technology, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I would argue against those folks, but we figured that it was worthwhile to bring in somebody uh, who does know the ins and outs of this, somebody whose background um, is in IT, you know, somebody who knows a little bit more about this stuff just naturally than, than Matt and I, to sort of break down uh, why Bitcoin, but specifically also blockchain concepts like smart contracts um, are, are bogus, right? So it's not just that they're being used for bad things now. It's just that it's it's always sort of been a gimmick. It's uh, unlike, like somebody argued to me that it's like the internet. You just got to give it like decades and it'll show basically a transformative yeah. world changing uh sort of uh you know effect and my point was first of all the internet was uh, useful to people immediately for communicating <laughs> um this is basically and what this is useful for is speculation so like yes. i think we can kind of draw some um, maybe lessons from there but david is uh one of my favorite on this topic he's one of he's, he's london based so i was telling david uh, i always when i'm about to go to bed at like three in the morning david gerard will be up uh taking on bitcoin people <laughs> uh in uk time and uh it's 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 influenced me uh, a little bit and uh, so i was glad to actually speak with him and his book uh, uh i haven't read the facebook one but uh attack the 50 foot blockchain is is really good particularly on this because this is what we get a lot which is okay you guys are right about the cryptocurrency speculation i don't like that but the underlying um technologies blockchain smart contracts that's where the money is and i think i kind of was open to that a little bit for like Me maybe too, the yeah. first couple of years and uh I, I am not open to that anymore <laughs> i i don't mean to uh, disappoint but uh particularly when you took it look at like the proof of work issues with uh energy consumption and how those some of these are sort of not in, not tractable um yeah i'm out but uh i don't know i've preambled quite a bit um do you have anything you want to say david I mean, there's just there's too much to say that it's not even worth yeah. opening up another line of, of talk. Um, I hope you all enjoyed this conversation. Matt and I will be back in, in a little bit too to talk about uh, um, the end of unemployment and why that's just an amazingly uh, disastrous move, not just for working people, frankly, but also for the U.S. economy. Sort of looking at to maybe the reasons why <laughs> and what that means for workers, um, plus much much more in the post game. And if you're and liking the content and all that kind of stuff, please join us at patreon.com slash left reckoning. We yeah, we got a we got a lot of stuff in the in the post game. We got uh, Crowder talking about the FBI. We have uh, Boris Johnson taking Amtrak to kind of impress Biden, uh, which is very funny to me. Um, and and maybe some Dave Rubin. We definitely have some uh, Dennis Prager. But uh, yeah, patreon.com slash left reckoning, where we have 911 patrons. Thank you all for remembering us. Um, and uh and yeah, we'll play this uh, David Gerard interview here and we'll be back in about 45 minutes, folks. All right, welcome back, Left Reckoners. I'm Matt Leck with me as always, David Griscom. And with us, David Gerard, author of Attack of the 50-Foot Blockchain, Bitcoin, Blockchain, Ethereum, and Smart Contracts. Uh, David, thank you so much for joining us from London tonight. Hello. Uh, I'm really glad to have you on particularly because there's a lot of books on uh, Bitcoin that are very worth like, people's attention. The uh, David Columbia book, which we were discussing a little bit uh, pre-recording, uh, uh, which is about the sort of right wing uh, sort of infestation or, uh, I guess, sheen or fundamental right wing nature of Bitcoin, shall we say, and cryptocurrency. Your book, uh, and you can uh, amend that characterization if you want. Your book, what I like about it, though, is it uh, directly addresses technological aspects of Bitcoin and crypto, such as the blockchain or smart contracts, that I think can serve as sort of flypaper to attract people who actually genuinely want a better world. And yep. uh, so I just, I just want to say thank you for your book. And uh, if, if you want to add anything to that uh, characterization of your work. Um. Yeah, I mean, 
Bitcoin isn't about the technology. It's the technology is a sort of, it's the hand waving, it's the MacGuffin. It's the selling point. Oh, don't worry about it. It's very complicated. You wouldn't understand it. Just give me the money and it'll be great. Um, but it's all about psychology. It's all about people and the flows of cash, you know? Right. Like, I mean, I wrote the book just making fun of this stuff because Bitcoin was invented by annoying internet libertarians who I had considerable experience of. And if those guys invent something, it's going to be comedy in certain ways. So it was comedy in all those certain ways. Basically, when you have people who are pretty smart and are absolutely certain they don't need to research anything that from their own intellects, they will come forth with a work of genius because they are the smart guys. The world is a simplified version of front-end JavaScript. If you know that, you've got everything. Mm. That's who wrote Bitcoin. Economics, well, I read this web page about gold and I think I can adapt it, that sort of thing. It's that, it's that species of thinking. Um, yeah, like when I wrote the book, um, I mean, I knew I'd have to cover Bitcoin's libertarian origins. Now, they were very sincere people. They were wrong, but they weren't sh charlatans. You know, they were mm. sincere ideological libertarians who wanted a better world where governments didn't control money and business was free. Um, so they invented this thing and what was I going with that? But basically it's, as Columbia's book says, it's the California ideology. It's a sort of melange of what happens when you get sort of hippies who get money for being good at technology and they have a lot of just world fallacy and they're convinced that their own genius means they deserve all this. And from that, we get transhumanists, Silicon Valley startup culture, um, the less wrong rationalists, Bitcoin, neo-reactionaries. They all come from the same sort of area in the 80s and 90s. Right. Um, it's, it's wild. And right. they use words in ways that aren't actually English. They're sort of specialist jargon. They never tell you they're using the jargon. So people who think, gosh, I'd like a better world. Perhaps this thing that's a trustless mechanism out of the control of the oppressor, this will do things for my purposes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember an interview with Columbia where he said that something like one of, he watched people, social activists get into blockchain because they wanted to make the world a better place. And they transmuted into um, talking about conspiracy theories and international bankers with mm -hmm. three brackets around it right. and worrying unduly about the, how their altcoin portfolio was doing. So, you know, you see a lot of that stuff. Yeah. So, and, and so I think we're sort of on board with all of that. Now we have occasionally, so I got a, actually a question here from somebody it says maybe Bitcoin ultimately serves uh, it says capital accumulation, but it's use as a peer to peer system is useful for the global poor. Now. And you know, so the first question, what is this promise of a peer to peer payment system? We hear the word decentralization thrown around, which is we've said on the show, if this was 30 years ago, they would have just said privatization, it seems to me, but that's um, discredited. Um, but like, what's the promise of a peer to peer system? Because like, to me, it seems like it'd be nice to just like the, the innovation that I've experienced is uh, I forget the app that you can just pay your friends through your own bank online. Um, I'm blanking on the name right now. With but Zell or something like that. But like, that's not really what, like, what's the extra peer to peerness that Bitcoin promises? And so that's important because the things that Bitcoin promises are not unreasonable, you know, like cash. We know how cash works. You have money. Like, you don't need to go to your bank to give someone a five pound note, you know, you just give it to them. I bought you a drink. Give me some money. Okay, here you are. You know, um, that sort of peer-to-peer -peer sort of thing. We have computers now. What if we could do that on computers? So the problem with computers is computers are copying machines. You know, cut and paste, you can make a copy of things. So the way we do digital cash now, and this system works really well in the UK, is it's all centralized and it's basically your card is a gateway to your bank account. Mm -hmm. That's money. It feels like money. People treat it as money. It's good for buying things with. It's not so good for giving people money. 
It's bad for that. It's actually really bad for that. It's great for being a consumer. So what if we could do it with peer-to-peer? -peer? This is not a wrong thing to want, right? It's perfectly reasonable. So, and of course, it'll keep governments out of your eyes. Yeah, you know, who wants the government looking over your shoulder? You know, governments are frequently wrong and stupid. These are not wrong things to want. The trouble is that this was all done by wild ideologues, um, a technological version of anarcho-capitalists, the gold bugs, Austrian economics in its formalized form. Um, and they had very odd ideas. Um, and some of them were really horrible people. Um, some of them were not so horrible. Some, some of them were quite nice apart from that, you know. Um, they wanted something that would have money that was out of government control. Now, what this really meant was they didn't want to be taxed. Right. Because mm -hmm. there's nothing more evil than tax, you know. Um, so, yeah, and that's not a wrong thing to want, but, you know, it turns out that taxes pay for things. So it's right. a tricky one. Um, so, yeah, um, you had a lot of these dreams and they were taught, spoken of in glowing terms, but when you dive into the ideology, you realize it's barely reskins, gold bugs, and banker conspiracy theories. And mm. that's not so great. A lot of Bitcoiners don't know that this is the origin, but it literally is. Like, it's really well documented. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've had people, Bitcoiners have no sense of history, right? They're very ahistorical. That's basically because there's a sort of turnover in Bitcoiners like every six to 18 months because they lose all their money and they disappear and a new bunch come in. So they'll act, react with outrage saying, what, how dare you call Bitcoin libertarian? Read a book. You know? <laughs> it's like the only ones who remember the history these days are the critics. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, and meanwhile, we're like kind of living history now because I think that kind of brings us to what today is going on in El Salvador. Um, so which uh, Naib Bukele basically proving a lot of these theses is um, so today we have him. Uh, well, yesterday he changed his bio to a dictator of El Salvador. And today he said, yeah. uh, we just bought the dip. 150 new coins. El Salvador now holds 700 coins. Hashtag Bitcoin. What's your uh, commentary on Bukele? Oh, boy. <laughs> so, Nate Bukele is a populist president. Um, like, imagine a much more on the ball and more coherent Trump. You know, like much more coherent than Trump was at 40. Mm. You know, he's, I don't like he, what he does or how he does it and what he wants to do, but he's very smart and capable. He is genuinely very popular because he spent a lot of money on public spending. The trouble with that is that El Salvador's currency is the US dollar. Mm -hmm. So he can't print money. In fact, the people are very suspicious if there was any sign of him printing money because by long experience, they don't trust governments with printing money out of thin air. It never ends well. So um, they actually use another country's currency because the currency of the US is quite a strong economy. It's the world reserve currency already. And so that's what they use. Now, Bikali has to get his money from somewhere. He's been borrowing it on the international bond markets, sovereign debt. Um, the bond traders have no faith in him. They, um, the Salvador bonds are very, um, they're very discounted. That shows, that's what bond traders do when they don't have faith the country will pay back the money. And so he's uh, messing around with financial plumbing in this way. And that, People are worried because he's a very impetuous sort of guy. He's the sort of guy who says something off the top of his head, then makes it policy. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, there was a thing about how they'd be mining Bitcoin using volcano power because El Salvador has a lot of geothermal. They're quite good at it. Mm -hmm. There's about 25% of their power. The rest they ship in. And so electricity is quite expensive there. Um, that was, he was on a, Twitter spaces call with a bunch of Bitcoiners. They were talking about Bitcoin. He just dialed in <laughs> and they saw his Twitter handle and went, Mr. President, sir. And they thought, <laughs> yes, hello, sir. We are so happy to see you. <laughs> you know, because who doesn't, what, what freedom loving libertarian would not welcome a quasi wannabe dictator? It's been very revealing. 
<laughs> I will say in fairness, there's a lot of libertarian Bitcoiners who are very pissed off about this mm. and not happy about the El Salvador thing. They're not happy how it's gone. A good example is a Twitter to follow, Mark Falzon. Mark oh, yeah. C. Um, he's a very sincere libertarian crypto guy. He went to El Salvador to see how this was going. He thinks it's been terrible and he's been just documenting what's been happening there. Um, right. So yeah, a good, he's a good example of a sincere Bitcoiner who is not happy at all with this stuff. So it's not all Bitcoiners at all. Moving close. Um, just too many of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but um, so Bekele has to come up with money from somewhere. I think his plan is to somehow print dollars or dollar equivalents using Bitcoin as the excuse. Um, his brothers, um, Ibrahim, Yusuf, and Karim, like the Bekele family, they're basically an unofficial cabinet, functionally. They all stick together. Um, he consults with his brothers. He's the boss, but he does listen to them. And But they're big coiners. And um, I think they he listened to their pitch and thought, I can use this. Because the one thing he needs is dollars. Mm -hmm. Salvador's um, income, nat its national GDP is about one quarter remittances sent by Salvadorans living in the US. Like, go to Salvador, get a work permit, work in the US, send money back. And there's a lot of smart, educated Salvadorans who, and so on, like, I get all these techies calling me with what's been happening, that sort of thing, um, who send back money this way. So the, he really wants to get his hands on those dollars because he needs actual dollars to pay the um, debts with. So if he can get actual dollars in from the US, from remittances, keep the actual dollars and distribute dollar equivalents inside a payment system, then he maybe he thinks that can solve his problem. Mm. Um, this is surmise, but it's widely held surmise and it fits the facts. Mm. So, and, it, yeah. and it just should be noted too that like one of the big selling points um, you know, that, that he made. And then also a lot of defenders of Bitcoin is that it's going to make remittances, you know, more affordable for folks, right? That there'll be less money taken off the top of that's not been the case, correct? Remittances to El Salvador are quite competitive and quite cheap. They're like a few percent. Now, the way he set this up is to have his system, which he's called Chivo. Um, mm. It's basically a payment system. It's like if PayPal had ATMs and access points and so on, you know, you put dollars or bitcoins in, they're a balance held on account, they're liabilities that Chivo has to you, that sort of thing, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so if you get the Chivo app in the US, the idea is that you can put dollars in, in the US, they come out the other end in El Salvador, the government subsidizes the cost. Now, Chivo is a bit of a wasted opportunity. Um, speaking in my finance hat, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, my Bitcoin stuff, I used to cover tech a lot more, but increasingly the story is just the people and the flows of cash. Mm -hmm. you know, all the technology is old, put together in some interesting ways. It's mostly interesting documenting how it fails. But um, so you can imagine a, a, the idea of an electronic payment system is it gets the money moving faster, uh, more economic activity, increase country's GDP, which is the sum of flows of of um, cash, not of cash itself, that could be a good thing, you know. Mm -hmm. The number one problem is building up trust. Mm. Like, I'm in the UK where people have faith that banks aren't just going to steal their money because we know the deposit schemes work because they had kicked in during the financial crisis and actually everyone got all their money back. We know the government isn't just going to up and steal our money. They'll tax the hell out of us, but they won't steal it, you know. Um, and it took 10 years for our touch card system to work, to get really popular. Like 2007, it was introduced. 2012, they pushed it hard. By 2017, it was more popular than cash. But it took time. I didn't trust it when it came out. I was keeping my card in a little tinfoil wrapper, you know, because I didn't because I knew that you could skim in FC cards from three meters away. But they showed the system was actually trustworthy, that they would fix problems and thefts, and that it would all be good. So you know, it worked. It had to build up trust. 
a payment system in Salvador, they're starting from people who use physical cash, don't trust banks, don't trust the governments, they, but they do trust that US dollars are worth something. How do you make that electronic? You'll have a lot of work and trust will be job number one. So basically the Chivo system doesn't work. Like they tried doing a whole new payment system in three months starting from nothing. My day job's in IT. I know about computers. <laughs> You literally can't do that, right? Mm -hmm. You cannot do a system in three months. It will break. Um, with payment systems, people are very particular about money. You know, they, <laughs> they will not take messing around or breakages or problems. Mm -hmm. You need to be perfect. You need to do small scale pilot systems, make sure things scale, make sure they work and so on and so forth. You know, the obvious things. Yeah. Otherwise, people get really seriously upset. So, yeah, um, he did everything completely wrong, such that Salvadorans not only curse the word Bitcoin, they're probably going to curse electronic payment systems in general. I mean, I'm glad to hear that there are certain Bitcoin proponents upset about that, because that's really shameful, uh, sort of to glom on your project that you're boosting onto a country that actually needs to do some stuff about like banking and just have a, you know, a sort of Elon Musk type figure or something running into the ground. Uh, <laughs> But um, I mean, they say this banking the unbanked thing, that's been a buzzword in Bitcoin since mm -hmm. about 2013. Right. Mm -hmm. And like, that isn't actually a problem that crypto can solve in El Salvador because the biggest problem in the modern world of banking the unbanked is documentation. Like enough to pass the money laundering authorities, um, which isn't ideal, but it's the business climate that we have. But in El Salvador, they've got a national ID card. Every adult's got one. Like you can get a bank account just but with your ID card. Mm. Um, and even then, only 30% of people have banks, bank accounts, because they don't see a need. It's too expensive. They haven't got money or something like that. You know, that's not a problem that adding Bitcoins is going to do anything about because the problem is making them want it and want to use it and see use cases for it. Right. I mean, I, I just wanted to, to add to that, too, because, like, again, like, yeah, the, the buzzwords about, like, banking the unbanked and, like, plugging people into the financial system is such a huge part of, you know, let's say, like, the kind of left or progressive side of, of the Bitcoin proponents, right? It's like, we're going to do something for, like, the poor in the, in the third world. But as you're saying, like, you know, oftentimes these these problems are much more, I mean, they're, <laughs> they're much more specific to, like, different regions, you know, just like how rural places are technology access and things like that instead of it just being one kind of oh it's like nobody's ever thought of trying to do digital payments um in another society before right it's like the, uh, you know that's been tried many a time and people don't adopt it um yeah so then tying it to you know an asset like bitcoin on top of it also just muddies the the entire process as well <laughs> it's just been a crypto buzzword in my other book libra shrugged about facebook they were going to do literally this thing and the thing is, Bitcoin has started, I mean, banking the unbanked is a phrase in international development. It has been for decades. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, it's saying that we've made a problem where people must have a bank account to live and, oops, some of them can't. I guess they're just poor and it must, they need motivational skills or something, you know. Right. Um, but um, Bitcoin has said, oh, we can solve this. We'll use Bitcoin. It'll bank the unbanked. Literally zero of them have ever come with a full worked out plan for this. Zero in eight years. Facebook didn't come up with one either. Like, I mean, I put the chapter on banking the unbanked. It's on my website, you know. Um, it sets out the problem and how they absolutely did not solve it. You know, it's you can't just add a new currency. It's all a lot of on-the-ground work showing people why they need this thing. Mm. What do you think you know? the real motivations behind Facebook or Jack Dorsey's always talking about Bitcoin? Is that just a Silicon Valley mindset, just sort of like how pervasive it is? Or what, what's your speculation on that? Um, I actually tried and failed to write an article about Jack Dorsey and Bitcoin for foreign policy. And I should probably finish that sometime. But um, <laughs> trying to work out his motivation. Um, I think you can understand Jack Dorsey if you understand he started as an absolutely generic Silicon Valley startup guy. If you look at his Twitter, you'll see he never posts anything that isn't advertising for his work. It's like the Twitter feed of a guy who doesn't actually have a personal life. You know, it's a business feed. 
But when he lost control of Twitter, he reinvented himself as an interesting Silicon Valley hipster type guy. This is in, there's a book about Twitter, which I forget the name of, uh, Breaking Twitter, I think it's called. I mean, you have, I'll have to look that up, mm. but um, I'm just reading it now. It sets out how Dorsey literally invented himself to be a boring Silicon Valley money guy's idea of an interesting person. <laughs> Not an actually interesting person, which is why he looks like a Burning Man billionaire. Yeah. Except <laughs> inexplicably fresh clothes or where's that stupid beanie or whatever. Um, it's, it's an invention. It's a front. The reason why I couldn't work out what this guy's personality was was because it was simply a mock-up made to look like a boring person's idea of an interesting person. Yeah. So why? what's Jackie Dorsey in it for? Um, the money. Uh, moving, <laughs> like with Facebook and um, Libra, now called DM, and it'll probably never launch. Um, I think a lot of the motivation was these guys are rich. They don't think they need governments. They have contempt for the idea of governments because governments do things like tax them. Right. And they do things like tell them they can't move their money around <laughs> without taxing. Authoritarianism. Them. Absolutely. <laughs> the status jackboot. So um, it's the shiny boots of leather on the IRS guy. So um, I think that's a lot of Dorsey's motivation. And I think he doesn't know how the hell money works or anything. He's good at running a business. He is, he's not dumb. He's not incapable. He's had two successful startups and that is not nothing, you know, mm -hmm. like he's clearly good at a thing he does, mm -hmm. but he has that thing where I'm rich and I must be a genius. Right which has a number of issues because, you know, um, at least there are some rich guys in the world who realize, hmm, Socrates was right. I'm a dumbass. But, you know, <laughs> um, Dorsey is not one of them. And Silicon Valley encourages you to think you are a genius because you have money. Right. And he's totally on board with that plan. So he does things like seed the world with Bitcoin. And he wants to make Bitcoin a big thing. Mm. And, <clears throat> I mean, these guys... They're clearly not stupid people. They're not unintelligent at all, but they talk well beyond their knowledge. Like when Elon Musk says, we'll come up with a version of Dogecoin that uses less electricity. Um, it's literally proof of work. It <laughs> works on wasting power. Right. You, know what I mean? you only need to know the technical details to work out why some claim is nonsense. And obviously nonsense if you actually know how any of this works. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that proof of work thing, that is the physics of it. You can't make a more environmentally friendly version of stuff because the intensity is like how it's proven, right? Or how it's checked. And, and that brings us to like the next point, right? You can maybe address that with that is you hear a lot, um, well, Bitcoin might be a scam or a speculative asset, but blockchain is where all the promise is. No. <laughs> so a bit of history on this one. I've got a, like a video talk I do. I've got like videos on my site, um, which is basically how, what is a blockchain and why is a blockchain? Mm -hmm. So what is a blockchain is super simple, right? It's just a ledger, like an accounting ledger where you can only add entries. You can't cross out old ones. It's append only. It uses magical mathematical trickery to mean that if you tamper, it's immediately obvious. Anyone can tell. Right, it's all cryptographically signed off. You know, each line has a little hash on it. You can tell whether it's been fiddled with, not what it might have been before, but you can tell it's been messed with. Hmm. So that's what the blockchain does. It's that plus a mechanism to decide who adds the next block or whatever. And proof of work mining is a way to do this without a central controller. That is, you have a whole bunch of guys wasting electricity as fast as they can to try to guess numbers to win a lottery to win the next Bitcoins. And the more lottery tickets you can create with your computers, the more chance you have of winning. And that's why people add more and more computers and it doesn't get any more efficient. And it ends up using a whole country to guess a number every 10 minutes or so. This is the point where people look at me and go, that sounds too stupid. You must be explaining it. <laughs> no, it is actually that stupid. And that's how it literally works. Why does anyone do this? Because they can make money at it. 
you know, the highest calling in human history is being able to make some money. Right. So therefore, it must be great. And so, yeah. Um, but the thing about, and blockchain as for business happened after Bitcoin crashed in 2014. <coughs> um, just a second. Mm-hmm. It crashed in 2014, right? Mountain Gox Exchange collapsed. Bitcoin's price plummeted. Um, it then had a sort of bad reputation as this money for crooks and drugs and stuff. You know. um, I mean, Bitcoin's first use case was working around government controls, you know, buying drugs. Right. Or more neutrally, buying things your government doesn't want you to. You know, um, let's, be, let's be unduly generous here. So, <laughs> but they wanted, people wanted to put it into business. Big, Bitcoin people thought, maybe we can sell this to the enterprise. So they started selling blockchain for business as this thing that would magically make your business work better. Well, what are the details? Well, don't worry about the details. It's trustless, decentralized. They literally <laughs> used the Bitcoin pitch with the buzzword changed. So the point is they put together, when you're selling the sausage, you just need to sell the sizzle. And if the sizzle is good enough, you never, ever need to actually deliver. That's how enterprise blockchain works. There is, I have not seen, speaking as someone who knows about this stuff, there is literally no blockchain use case I've seen that does better than existing systems. Hmm. None. The only use case it has is doing a cryptocurrency. And if you do that, you've got other problems. Right. And I, I just wanted to know, like here in, in Austin, Texas, which is, you know, not sin free when it comes to this stuff. There's this huge ad campaign going on right now. And they'll just big billboards that say, buy Bitcoin. You don't need to understand it. It makes money. Right. You don't and need to understand it. It makes money. <laughs> it reminds me, too, of like 2017. I was just um, telling Matt this, you know, there was the Long Island Tea Company right which was a company that made you know bottled iced teas and they changed their name to the long island blockchain company <laughs> and their stock value just skyrocketed and i and i looked back at the the story until very recently and they're actually now under investigation by the sec um because it definitely looks like they knew what they were doing um you know regarding Dragon insider Buster's trading basically repeatedly. Um, but you can see uh how people do just attach the term blockchain um to you know just literally to their business or to some kind of technology that they're using to make it seem like it's this big confusing thing that you don't understand but it's revolutionary is going to change the world and, and oddly not the people you want to trust are doing that <laughs> <laughs> exactly i mean they use words like trust and trustlessness a machine for trust the use of the word trust is that one computer doesn't have to trust the output of another computer mm -hmm. It doesn't mean the general English language usage of this very specific jargon. Mm -hmm. It's it's bollocks all the way down. Yeah, yeah. This, well, this brings us to the smart contracts, I think, finally, which is like your, your book does such a great a job at explaining the fundamental philosophical error. Like smart contracts are not Yale law is not like, oh, we're going to have to stop teaching contract dispute law because, you know, smart contracts are going to figure it all out. Tell us why we can expect this not to pan out <laughs> so smart contracts are not smart and they're not contracts they are literally little computer programs that live on the blockchain and are triggered by actions on the blockchain if you're in computing these are known as database triggers or stored procedures we don't use them if we can't avoid it because they're very hard to work with and reason with and so forth um, you only use them when you absolutely have to. Um, so, of course, they built their entire sort of blockchain economy around. <laughs> I mean, it's an interesting and clever idea. It's just the reality is very stupid. Mm. So you have these programs that are very hard to change or edit. Uh, the original conception of them was they could not be changed, um, which is incredibly stupid. Because, you know, uh, what, what do you call a program that can't be changed? A sitting duck for attackers. You know, if you mm -hmm. can't fix bugs, then I can exploit your bugs as soon as I find them. If you can change them, then why the hell are you doing it in, in a program you can hardly edit? You know? Right. Um, so 
what we see now, the latest version of this is DeFi, decentralized finance, which is not decentralized in any manner. There are people running it who take the money. Mm -hmm. um, they do this by putting up smart contracts to automatically run a sort of trading system so that crypto gamblers can rip each other off. And experienced Wall Street traders can come in, find a market which is unregulated and full of suckers, giggle hilariously to themselves and take all the money. I, a lot of my moral drive in writing the book was that mums and dads and grandmas and so on would get ripped off by crypto crooks, which does happen. You should get angry about it. Mm -hmm. If you are going to go on Binance Smart Chain and give all your money to rugpool.finance, my sympathy is limited. Um, theft is bad, but I will point and laugh at you. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, DeFi, the great thing about it is it has this very brittle, unforgiving programming model that's very hard to get right, using a terrible language, Solidity, which is if anyone does computers, like Solidity is like JavaScript, but much, much worse. It's amazing. Um, it is like full of ways to shoot yourself in the foot. So, of course, they process millions of dollars, supposed of money through it. So, yeah. Um, and all the drive is to be first to market. Mm. So taking your time and doing things slowly, that costs money. Mm. And they get auditors to audit the code. Well, in computer science, we have the halting problem, which means you cannot tell what a program will do until you've used it in the general case. In specific cases, you can. In general, you can't. But also, the auditors are usually blockchain clowns as well. So a DeFi contract is correctly viewed as a sort of pinata full of cryptos, and if you whack it the right way, you get the money. <laughs> and this happens over and over. Uh, that DeFi get hacked, or they get hacked which, um, sorry, all your money is gone. Yeah. So, yeah, um, it's like an amazing crypto in general is a recapitulation of every financial fraud, scam, and grift in 400 years at fast forward. Yeah, it's I mean, absolutely fascinating. I will never stop watching this while it's going because it's just too hilarious and terrible. Yeah, like that stuff, it, it just... I don't know if you have anything, David, but like the, the, the way that I've seen smart contracts pitched versus you see the fundamental reality of it, which is like, yeah, it's computers talking to computers. So if you can trick one of the computers to, you know, um, uh, matching for some reason the terms of the contract that is immutable mm -hmm. now, then you can't say, oh, actually, that's not what I meant in that contract. I meant something else. I mean, it's just obviously it's that's not the problem with contracts. I mean, it's a game of gotcha. Right. right. Which is why we typically have like, you know, intelligent, not all lawyers are smart, but you know what I mean? Some smart people on, on both sides of it trying to make sure that you're not getting screwed by some kind of really, really obscure interpretation of the piece of paper that, that you're signing. Um, yeah. And, yeah. I mean, you know it in your book, and I'm sorry, I can't share it on the screen because it's uh, on my other computer, um, but you know uh, a quote from uh, Matt Levine. Uh, from Bloomberg that says, you know, yeah. my immutable, unforgivable, uh, cryptographically secure blockchain record proving that I have 10,000 pounds of aluminum in a warehouse is not much use to a bank if I then smuggle the aluminum out of the warehouse through the back door, right? right? And which is one of the big points that you're noting is that, you know, you can even set these things up, uh, you know, through code. And I, I know there's some problems with the code itself, but its relationship to the actual like physical world <laughs> um, is, is not that, uh, you know, is not that tight. Yeah, the way they solve this is to use oracles, which provide data to the smart contract so it can do things based on the data. <coughs> so one of the standard smart contract attacks is rig the oracle. Make sure the oracle goes funny. Or do something like flood Ethereum with transactions so that the oracle fails, all the numbers come to zero, everyone else washes out and you get the money. <laughs> it's just stupid. But, you know, there's money to be made. Right. Yeah. Not I mean, them, but by someone. the marketing of it, I mean, you really see like this is just when I read about like this, the settling of America and boosters talking about land, that's just amazing to grow. Like that's just this is just where we're at uh, now with Bitcoin.
Um, one final thing I want you to uh, comment, and you kind of did up front, but there's a, a, a relationship that I've sort of been noticing. Uh, 10 years ago, libertarians would have been gold bugs. Now they are more and more on the crypto side of things. But that's not a perfect relationship either. Uh, I'm, I'm curious what you uh, have to say about that relationship between, because it seems there, there's some like one's an actual thing and one is funny money, but yet there's a lot of convergence. Um, so in practice, the, goal, the serious Austrian fans, they, they're interested in Bitcoin. They're fascinated by it. They don't buy the pitch because they can see the obvious thing that, look, that's not digital gold because I can cut and paste it and make my own coin. Mm -hmm. And thousands of people have. But they talk to each other, you know. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> it's, it's really wild, actually, because gold bugs come off as swivel-eyed lunatics. But when they talk about Bitcoin, they sound very sane <laughs> and reasonable by comparison. Like Peter Schiff, who is a gibbering madman, um, he's much richer than me, so he's clearly doing something that right that I'm not, you know. But so clearly he's good at what he does, but what he says is nuts, except when he's talking about Bitcoin, when he is the calm voice of sanity, certainly compared to the Bitcoin as he trolls. So, you know, <laughs> um, at least I'm, I'm coming to think that gold bugs, well, they're badly wrong in all sorts of ways, but at least like gold has some history. <laughs> You know, it has some cultural weight to it. Um, any comparisons of Bitcoin to gold are strictly Bitcoin marketing. Right. Mm -hmm. Everything uh, Bitcoin says is marketing. Also, they both have uh, their eye on inflation um, quite a bit too, which is a little bit telling maybe. Yes, they both successfully predict 200 of the last two recessions. <laughs> uh, I mean, Bitcoin is mostly a symptom, Right. Life is terrible. The economy is going down the toilet since 1980 when neoliberalism proper started. Neoliberalism has hit the problem that eventually you run out of other people's public assets to strip. So even if you want to do a capitalism, then that's doing it wrong. Um, so interest rates are low. People are living worse and worse. They're not happy. They're getting desperate. And um, so they turn to stuff that's nuts. Rich people, there's no percentage um, return on sane investments. So they go for insane investments. They, I'll just get a bit of Bitcoin, which is bad and wrong and dumb. Poor people go, I'm screwed. I might as well buy lottery tickets. And they go, yeah. I'm going to get in the crypto. Um, it's a symptom of hopelessness. And you see stuff like, when the pandemic hit, what did the Fed do? Oh, no, the stock market number is going down. You know, the real economy is screwed. They went, oh, no, the stock market number is going down. We'll buy all the stocks and yeah. keep the number up, which is like you have a gauge that indicates the economy. And what they do is they grab their finger and push the number up and said, look, look how good the number is. You know, meanwhile, people are going, healthcare, please, relief yeah. checks, please. No. You are dissolute poor people. We must give it to the stocks. And people got upset about that too. They felt for some reason that the system was going to screw them. So all this Bitcoinery, it's a symptom of desperation, I think. It wouldn't be nearly as popular without it. There are people who just want to lose their money, I think. They're, we all have a friend or relative who's like this, who just finds a scam and gets another scam and gets another scam or whatever. You know, 20 years ago, they were buying ostrich farms. Now they're buying Bitcoins. Um, and if they ever succeed, they lose all their money six months later on the next scam. So those people will be perennial, but um, cir material circumstances are making a lot more people like that because they cannot see any other way out. Right. And, you know, I think the solution is you need to apply yourself to a bit more social political change, but that's work and risky and you might get your head broken and stuff it's much easier to stay home and gamble yeah i i think like you note that like specifically like it really preys on for example people's 
rifle frustration with like the Fed and um, you know central yes. banking in general and the feeling that the system is is rigged. But this is why, like maybe to use another analogy, like this is why it frustrates me because sometimes like people are trying to sell it point to a lot of real problems, right? Like, you know, the Fed, yeah, there's a lot of problems there. Financial Absolutely. systems really screwed. There's an article we did last week, um, you know, it's really promoting it as a solution to like, you know, the humanitarian crisis in Palestine, right? And yeah, and it infuriates me. And, you know, the thing is like the first 750 words like are accurately portraying like the hardship that people are going through. And then it says, and look, Bitcoin is like going to be the solution because some people there are buying Bitcoin and hoping that they, you know, are able to sell it for a higher price later, essentially, right? And it's like, well, this isn't a solution, right? You're noting all of these like problems in a society. And then as you were saying earlier, yeah, people buying a lottery ticket and hoping that it's gonna get them out of a fundamentally political structural problem that is creating the issues in their life. Okay, so I ask all the right questions. Like, why didn't a lot of bankers go to jail in 2008? Mm -hmm. That's a question a lot of people ask, but um, their answers are on crack. Being able to ask the right questions does not actually get you points in practice. Mm -hmm. You know, ideas are cheap, but we have to look at the system as it happened. And <coughs> cryptocurrency has been a sort of perpetual motion, custard pie, slapstick Rube Goldberg machine that keeps circling pies over and over and over um, with two people with very short memories. Mm -hmm. It's like a very complicated machine and you've got this great big machine. It's got all these dials and levers and all the, it's like a casino with 10,000 games in it and actual people's money goes in at one end and goes out to about 20 guys. Yeah. Like that's how it works. It's terrible stuff. The only reason it's been allowed to go on this long is because in terms of the worldwide financial markets, crypto is still tiny. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And even then, in the last year or so, you've heard governments really worrying. What if these bozos destabilize things? What if they get into the system enough to destabilize things? You know, it's like Bitcoin has said for years, take us seriously. And the government went, okay. <laughs> you know. Um, and I mean, the goal of the regulators and so forth is to keep the system going as it exists mm -hmm. but their goal is actually stability not letting some bozos crash it so, yeah. yeah well david gerard the book is attack of the 50-foot blockchain bitcoin blockchain ethereum and smart contracts uh david and i couldn't recommend it enough to somebody who might be uh, dabbling particularly into this i think it's be it's it's tailor-made for uh, somebody like that who uh who might think there might be something to smart contracts and that's why you want to get on the ground floor. So David, thank you so much for your work. And thank you. And also get the second book, Libra Shrugged, the one about Facebook's foray into cryptocurrency and how it crashed and burned because they were really stupid. There you go. Yeah, folks, uh, I very much enjoyed talking to uh, David. Yeah, a <laughs> uh, very fun guy. Very, uh, yeah. I love his uh, his thing with the ostrich farms. Do you know about that? I didn't actually. So, like the ostrich. I mean, I don't know maybe what he's referencing, but I know like in the late nineties, early two thousands, there was like ostrich eggs in particular were like a big thing. Everyone was like, these things are legit and it's fancy. It meant a lot to you know be eating an ostrich egg omelet, um, and uh, yeah. I'm sure this is not unique to Texas, but uh, all these people start getting them on their farms, <laughs> all these ranchers, because you were making a lot of money selling the eggs and everybody was really into it. This I remember like as a kid going- This is like the to, tulip thing. Yeah, I'm pretty much classic thing. Yeah. And then, yeah, of course, as you know, eventually like people were like, why the fuck are we eating these weird ass things? And people stopped <laughs> buying them. But the funniest thing is people just let them go. <laughs> like ostriches and like emus right because they were worthless to them no um, of course but that's horrible jesus so, like, Christ. Just these wild birds i mean there's not too many of them I mean, it's 2021 now so it's been enough time for a lot of them to die out unfortunately but yeah they were just like sort of you know every once in a while people would like encounter like an emu or an ostrich in the wild here in that's texas that's unbelievable i mean well that's you i remember at the start of this whole pandemic thing was really popular on netflix uh tiger king mm 
Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, talk about the grim side of like capitalist enterprise in the animal field. Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah. No, things get hot um, for a little while, and then people, yeah. <laughs> it's it's like you know john taffer's like yeah the bar was really good when it was brand new and people were checking it out and then shift <laughs> off and then all of a sudden i got these fucking lions i need to, <laughs> or tigers <laughs> i need to feed every day so i'm going to like every butcher and fucking down getting their scraps um yeah so i have been reading adam tooze's new book on the COVID pandemic, we had him on Majority Report. Yeah, uh, I got it right here too. I've been enjoying it. People it's to, uh, snag it. It's very, very. He's very great at contextualizing. You know, comparative governance, which is, I think, the best way to look at you know how the world responds to a pandemic. Shocking, uh, and he talks about the CARES Act and kind of the uh, brief sort of because we didn't have an infrastructure for welfare in this country, we just threw cash at people. Um, and how that was sort of, uh, radical and very good. And now we have the story here and let me, uh, stop sharing. Yeah, here we go. Um, from Bloomberg. Employers are baffled. I was like, this is like scientists are baffled. Um, you know, like the classic headline: employers are baffled as U.S. benefits end and jobs go begging. Now, before David gets into the sort of economic nuts and bolts of what we're seeing here, I actually know somebody who is going back to work because these benefits ended and they're forced mm -hmm. to because of anxiety about income. Uh, so even if it did work, this is still a vampiric. Look, like this is look at the fundamental coercion in capitalism, and it's brutal. And and you know this person is going back to school, and I will also say, um, you talk about, for instance, um, Amazon talking about the fight for fifteen and Whole Foods and Jeff Bezos. He loves to mm -hmm. get that fifteen dollar minimum wage. Not more than that, even in downtown Brooklyn. That's just a little birdie told me. Uh, they'll give you 15, but no more. Not even if you have another job, say that you can leverage and you don't even need to take it. They'll, they'll, they like, so this thing about uh, begging for like workers, right? I, I call bullshit on it. Um, but anyway, I, I, it, it makes me, uh, I'm going to let David go off in a second here, but it, uh, it infuriates me. And especially in the context of, uh, getting messages, like a lot of student or former students are about student loans going to have to repay that in a few months. This is the whip cracking, um, basically. Mm -hmm. The global whip that Joe Biden controls, and he's choosing to let it whip people back into work. And it, this, this, whether it does or does not bring people back to work, they're not, I don't think it's really going to change anyone's mind about it, because this is what they want to do. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot here, and I'm trying to think of the best way to, to start, because... Um, let me just start with the $15 an hour thing, just like as a kind of side note, that's one thing that is sort of frustrating to me because it's like $15 an hour is like the minimum, right? And what we mean by that is like, not just like the minimum wage, right? But like what you mean by the minimum wage is like, this is like the least amount of money that people can make an hour that we will accept as like a legal threshold in this country. Anything other than that is illegal and coercion. Um, you know, so it's just like, it's so sickening when you see <laughs> companies be like, oh, look, we're paying people $15 an hour as if we're supposed to be, you know, patting them on the back. I mean, that's, that's basically what we're saying is like, that is the very bottom spectrum of, of wages in this country that we will accept, right? Anything other than that will be illegal because it's immoral to pay anybody that. Yeah. It's immoral to waste somebody's time. Yeah, exactly. And it's just like, you know, so $15 an hour is just not enough uh, to get by. And I think like, I don't know. That's a whole other conversation. But I think sometimes, you know, we can get wrapped up in those fights sometimes as socials where people think that like $15 an hour is necessarily like a good wage, right? Which is <laughs> not um, anywhere, uh, not alone, uh, let alone New York City. But if you could bring that piece up real quick, Matt, because um, there's a couple of notes I wanted to make and then just sort of like introduce the puzzle and then maybe sort of add like a macro Marxist analysis as to why this is going on. Um, so this piece goes, employers are baffled as U.S. benefits end and jobs go begging. Right. Because the assumption was, is that if you got rid of the, uh, you know, these these payments, the folks that everybody would be going back to work. Um, if you go down, like maybe just like two or three paragraphs, let me see. Um, yeah. 
So they're talking about how this person who does analysis is is missing folks. Um, they're not showing up, even though they've raised their wages um, for a temporary job, by the way, um, which I think sort of shows Jeez. the problem with these things. Um, but if you go down, to, I think it's the next uh, little bit here. Um, Across the country, staffing firms and businesses have yet to see a market uptick in employees. Goldman Sachs Group Incorporated economists forecast that the expiration of the federal program this month, which affected about half of U.S. states after the rest ended benefits early, would add 1.3 million people to payrolls by year end. Other analysts said an end to the federal program should increase labor supply. We go down just right out under that. Um, this is the quote here. That's the real nasty aspect of it. We're only going to see the impact of the federal UI benefits ending a couple of months from now. I don't think we're going to see a big spike one way or the other, really, um, said Anne Elizabeth Conkle, an economist at Indeed Incorporated. We thought things should be better by Labor Day, and they're not. And that's good for there. Um, let's be very clear what they mean by that timeline. Uh, they are saying that people will lose any kind of savings that they have um, and that people will be motivated quite literally in that situation by hunger, right? I mean, this is as basic as Matt was saying earlier of, of, of you know, cracking the whip as, as you could imagine. Same with and, the eviction stuff, by the way. Yeah. I mean, and on top of it, the evictions, no doubt about it. Um and, and, and this is the thing about this, this particular moment that is so frustrating. These payments politically have been immensely popular. Um, in fact, most Americans support them. Uh, I, I, oftentimes when people ask me about you know, the Texas elections in 2020, I remind them um, that uh, you know, folks here were very, very pro payments. And in fact, some of the people who voted for Donald Trump over Joe Biden, including Hispanics and, and black folk in the state of Texas, did so because they found the unemployment benefits and the stimulus payments that they got to be mighty helpful um, in getting by in this you know hellscape that we're all living in. And that's the fact. Um, why is this a threat to the Biden administration? It's because what it has ended up creating is an ability for some working people to be able to say no to absurd situations, to be able to say no to temporary work, right? Work where they're not going to, you know, there's no promise of a future, certainly no benefits or anything like that. People saying no to jobs that are just absurd. I know the people listening to this show know, as well as the next person, what working life in America is like. It's fucking sucks. Um, and it doesn't matter really <laughs> um, what industry you are in. Um, the state of work in this country is abysmal. Uh, we have seen decades and decades and decades of erosion of just basic workers' rights. We talk all the time about how some of the labor fights that we're seeing today are labor fights that were fought 100 years ago. I'm um, just ba basically trying to reset the board uh, to what it used to be. And the money that some folks have had over this past year has not like Nobody's sitting fat on the land. You know what I mean? Like nobody's sitting in luxury, but it has meant that that kind of constant state of anxiety that you have as a working person has been alleviated and the ability to say no to things um, has been something that is, uh, you know, much more prevalent for American workers, something that has been missing for an extremely long time. Um, there's a pull up this quick. I, I have these uh, these charts to sort of break down why this is sort of insane on like an economic standpoint, though. Um, and I'll, I'll give you guys a spoiler alert as to why they're doing it. It's to break the confidence of labor. Um, but let's look at to why this is so insane. If you look, pull up this Jackman piece really quickly, oh, yeah. I just want to give uh, Matt Brunegg credit for this figure. Um, and then we can go to the EPI stuff. Um, Matt Brunegg, I think, had this is just smart calculus. This is like, you know, uh, working class, uh, class warfare kind of analysis here. He says 35 million Americans are losing unemployment today. And this was earlier this month on September 6th. And basically the way that uh, Matt Brune calculates this is the way that it's experienced by most folks. So instead of it necessarily being the people who directly lost unemployment benefits, it was calculating the households that were losing unemployment benefits. And as again, as I know most of y'all, myself included, I know Matt, um, you know, we live in multi-person households uh, where other people work. Um, 
somebody loses income, that is a pretty significant blow to the community itself, right? To the household itself. That means someone else is having to pick up more groceries, all these other kind of things, right? So this way of calculating this, I think, is is truthful, right? It's not just like a rhetorical trick. It's actually saying, what is the effect of this on a lot of people? And the point is, is that um, if you scroll down a little bit, it'll show exactly where. And uh, I'd be curious what you have to say here, but uh, um He's noting here that it's it's a lot bigger than this nine point two million dollar number that they've sorry nine two nine point two million people um, that they were citing, and in fact, around thirty five million people, ten percent of the United States population, live in households that are scheduled to lose unemployment income. I'm one of those. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean we're all being yeah. hit by it, like uh, across the board. Um, and, and yeah, it's, like, it's just like it reminds me of the um, the the. Um, two's book, which is like, that was nice. It was <laughs> like, because on top of at the start of this pandemic to see somebody you're close to be forced by a company to get on the train where you don't know what the fuck this is, right? You don't know what's safe. You're told this is where like complete novel virus and your boss says, okay, we're, we're, we hear that stuff about the coronavirus, but still come to work like past like the fucking MBA shut down at this point, all this stuff still come out only to like put you on furlough or whatever the fuck later, um, like a few weeks later. And then, yeah, t like th hor that was horrible enough on top. Like at least there was the unemployment like benefits yeah. for the people that were in the uh, formal economy enough to have that work out for them. Yeah. And on top of that, so many people are outside of that. Economy. Exactly. Yeah. Really important point to make. And this was a massively effective program. It was massively popular. And the thing that's so annoying about it is it was also very beneficial to the U.S. economy, right? Like, you know, Matt and I have been critics of the way that the federal government has handled the pandemic, not only like under Biden now where they're trying to cut back these things, but the moment CARES came out. Um, oh, yes. I remember with Michael doing coverage of why this was completely inefficient at delivering for us. Um, and what the primary goal there was always to maintain the consumer economy that is the engine of American capitalism today, right? So let's just like let that be known right here, but let's criticize it within its own terms, right? Within its own grammar, within its own worldview. These kind of cuts are so damaging to the US economy. And it's sort of perplexing sometimes that any kind of manager of capital would be doing this. Um, um, though later we will show exactly why, because sometimes capitalists and the people who manage capital, which is in this case, the United States government, right? The people who are looking out for the long, this is the way to think about it, y'all. The people who look out, they don't take orders from the capitalists. They don't, you know, sometimes they do, right? But more often than not, they are coming up to the big corporations and they're saying, we're doing this because it'll benefit you in this, this, and this way down the line, right? They look out for the long-term stability and success of this system, right? Individual corporations might have, you know, particular interests that sometimes are in contradiction with this and there's a conflict, but the role of the state in maintaining capitalism is to ensure the long-term stability of the system. And that's why they come out more much, but I don't mean to bury the lead here. If we pulled this first slide. I, I want to just note this because it's pretty wild. This is from the Economic Policy Institute. Um, if you do the text first, we'll do the graphic second. Um, this is a study, and you can read this piece. It's in the Economic Policy Institute's website. Um, it's in their blog titled All Pain, No Gain. Um, and they are highlighting this study. Uh, the study found uh, on the loss of unemployment benefits. The study found the benefit losses following these early terminations led to only the smallest boost in job finding. So what they're doing in this study, just to be clear to folks, is they were looking at states that cut the benefits early right? Places like Texas, um, to see what the effect was on employment. Um, because if you remember earlier, we were talking about how the economists cited in that CNBC piece were saying like, oh, well, we'll see this in December, right? This is looking at what the, the net effect of this was. Um, the study found the benefit losses following these early terminations led to only the smallest boost in job finding. Earnings from work rose by only $14 per unemployment insurance recipient per week in states that cut off benefits. But weekly UI income fell by $278 for an average weekly net loss of $264 per recipient. 
Because of lower total incomes, UI recipients spent $145 less weekly. On an annualized basis, the average person losing UI saw their annual income drop by $13,728, leading to an annual spending reduction of $7,450. Now, to make this, to make people this is really clear what they're talking about here is people are losing this income, the income that they use to go and buy groceries, to get their car fixed, to fill it up with gas, right? All of these things that make the economy move, make the economy hum, right? Like this whole system is, is a drag. Don't get me wrong. But like the fact is, is that people going out and spending their money is how we all have money. (laughs) <laughs> in our pocket at the end of the day, right? Economic spending is sort of allows these things to work as a multiplier effect that it allows more and more economic um, activity to happen. That's why it's beneficial to the economy because that creates more jobs, more opportunity, and a larger flow of money and goods and services is better for folks, right? This is why working class people are much more beneficial uh, to the US economy when they have money in their pocket than rich people. Because I know everybody listening to this show right now, if you had $250 more in your pocket right now, there are some things that you would like to be able to take care of, right? Um, you know, be it debts or be, it, you know, maybe getting a little bit more food in the refrigerator, et cetera, right? All of those things allow that money to be distributed around the population, right? Um, when rich people have money, they just put it away or they, they, you know, they bury it in some kind of speculative asset, um, right? When we get money, uh, we use it typically to, to pay each other to do stuff for one another. That's why this kind of thing is hitting us so um, bad. And, and just while we're still on this thing, if you don't mind putting up that second slide, because yep. this is just a graphic that really highlights what this is going to mean on a macro uh, level. Um, so this is again from the EPI. Unemployment benefit cuts will significantly reduce income and consumer spending. Annualized income and spending losses due to unemployment insurance recipients losing benefits in June, July, or September 2021. And you can see right there, this is the income loss, what's hitting all of those folks. And this is the money, the spending loss, $79.2 billion. Money that people are not, again, using to buy food in their community, um, to get their car fixed, right, to pay folks. Um, instead, that money is just evaporating. So at a moment right now where we're talking about how we're, you know, there's this worry about entering into an economic crisis or an employment crisis, all this kind of thing. What is the solution that the government is putting forward? Well, let's just take a shitload of money out of the economy. Like take a shitload of money out of the consumer economy. It just, it, it's insane, like even on their own metrics. Does that make sense? Matt? Yeah. And I mean, this is just the, the normal uh, operating procedure of capitalism to affect 35 million families. Mm -hmm. Think of the way people throw numbers around, you know, when indicting communism. And this is just like a thing, nobody really even bats an eye at. This is just like what we have to do. We have to deprive people until they get back into the labor force for Mm -hmm. probably a lower wage than they exited with, maybe. No, absolutely. I mean, this is discipline in its pure sense. Um, and I highly suggest, um, I can't go over it and maybe this could be something we could do in the future, but the making of global capitalism, a book by Sam Gindon and Leo Panich is really uh, influential on me. And it's something that y'all should check out. I mean, it's a, it's a book, right? It's a, it's a, it can be a little bit dense, but they're, they're fun enough writers and they're talking about important stuff that sort of goes through the history of, of capitalism and one thing that's really notable is the willingness of some of these groups, capitalists, right, to take particular hits as long as it means that labor um, is is not militant. That's particularly what happens in the '70s, right? Is that um, the 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 kind of early kind of social democracy, whatever you want to call it in the U.S that led to the growth in the unions, that led to a higher standard of living with working class people, right? Meaning a kind of similar dynamic, right? It was much more robust then, um, but a kind of similar dynamic where people had a couple bucks in their bank account, maybe had owned some a home or something like that, that they were more willing to say no. And of course they were unionized, right? And what did capital do? I mean, that's the beginning of, of, of uh, not the beginning, but it's, it's a major turning point in our era is the breaking 
of, of labor across the board. And they did that one through the quite direct ones of like breaking strikes, right? Um, the, uh, the, you know, the, uh, the breaking of the air traffic controller strike um, and through the federal reserve. And if you could just pull this last bit up, Matt, um, it's the piece. Um, so I sent it to you in the email. Oh, yeah. um, sorry, y'all. Uh, it's, it's the CNBC federal reserve. Gotcha. I just want to highlight this because this is one of those things you have to understand about uh, modern capitalism that there's just completely different rules. As Matt was saying earlier with Adam twos and um, you know, Richard Wolf will make the same point too. Is like, they didn't really know what to do because so much of the U uh, S whenever the United States intervenes in, in, in the markets or right, in the economy directly, it's basically to pump up asset prices. And I just wanted to juxtapose the, the destruction, the, you know, the walking away and pulling all that money out of the unemployment benefits, right. And sucking that money out of the economy uh, versus what's going on for asset holders. And, and the <laughs> Monday was a big day. Monday, there was a lot of drops in the market, pr- primarily because of fears out of China, but also because people were worried that the Federal Reserve is going to start to slow down um, its activities. Um, if you just scroll down here, that was I, let me read the title. Um, this is the difference, right? So we're talking about unemployment benefits going away for us, but what's the Federal Reserve doing for those who have a lot of money um, and power in the society? Federal Reserve holds interest rates steady, says tapering of bond buying coming soon. Uh, The Fed benchmark interest rates anchored near zero. We've been living in that era for a long time. Uh, Maybe check out some of my old gems to to look at the (laughs) issue. Um, Officials indicated they expect to begin reducing monthly asset purchases soon, but did not say when. Um, You know, people could check out the article on, on their own later, um, if, if they would like to. But basically what this is saying is that while the Federal Reserve has an intention of sort of pulling back on some of these programs, these emergency programs, they're going to maintain them for a while. Um, and and just to, for folks who have sort of missed what's going on, because I know this is like something that doesn't touch your life in the most direct way because we don't own stocks, right? Um, basically what the Federal Reserve has done is, you know, prepared itself to, for example, do things like buy corporate debt. Um, to involve itself directly in the bond market, to basically buy up assets when needed to make sure that a certain price um, is, is held. And what that means if you're a speculator, right, which is what people who buy stocks are, um, it means that, well, you have confidence, at least in the short term, that these things aren't going to go bad on you. So why not buy some stock in, as we were talking about earlier, the Long Island blockchain company, <laughs> right? Or like any of these kind of funker things, because there's a kind of, not that everybody wins, right? There are losers, don't get me wrong. Not that every stock is just going up uh, necessarily, but there's a lot more security than typically, than honestly, the most free marketeers um, would tell you, right? People who say like, be smart, invest, right? Uh, you know, the, the, the game's a lot more rigged than it typically is, and that's because the maintenance of asset prices is, is a key metric um, for the Federal Reserve and by extension also the Biden administration and the federal government. Um, and it, it's important to just note the difference in how the pandemic might apparently be over for all of us, even though more people are sick, hospitalized, and dying than ever before. Um, we're all being forced back into work. We're losing our unemployment benefits. Oh, but the, the programs are basically are making sure that the largest transfer of wealth that we've seen in our lifetime, which is a phrase we use constantly, um, but we saw another massive one in the COVID-19 pandemic. It's sort of like those like weather events where it's like, this is a, this is a once in every 500 year flood. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's becoming every year now, right? Yeah. Or now every couple of months, um, we're just seeing these, these schemes that are benefiting the super wealthy and, and the elite in the society. Um, and I don't know. I mean, it's very clear that there's two different worlds. Um, I mean, and it's all, I don't want to sit here and sound like I have too much, like a shitload of sympathy for the federal reserve, but it's like, what else are they going to do? Because they, they know that they can't crash this stuff right now either because that would be disastrous across the board, right? The financial system starts to fall in the middle of all this. It's disastrous, right? But you see the difference in the kid gloves for capital versus workers, because as I was saying earlier, the state has a different relationship with these two groups, right? They're looking out for the long-term profits of the people at the very top. And they want to make sure that all of us schlubs get back to fucking work um, and stop complaining and take what we get. Right. 
And that's the two realities that, that we have. And there's no, like, th this is why the moment, like now we have to sort of zoom out of just trying to understand them at their own logic, because the game's very simple. We have a system that benefits a few folks. We have a government that is set up with the, with the goal essentially of maintaining those, those profits in the long run, not every single capitalist, but the vast majority of them for sure, making sure that there's stability in the dollar, making sure, making sure that there's stability in, in profit, making sure that there is, um, you know, possibility of, of capital accumulation, right? That's the functional aspect of the government. Um, and there was a period of time when they felt it was beneficial to make sure that workers um, we're getting a little bit of that money to make sure that the entire thing didn't collapse. Um, but it's becoming very clear that uh, they're seeing the, you know, the end of the utility of that. And that's when we all get forced back to work. Um, this is why you can't wait on uh, reformers or people like Joe Biden to, to get us out of these kind of crises um, because uh, they'll create new ones. And this is literally what th this unemployment situation is, is a creative crisis. Mm. And what's, what's funny is like, it's happening even though elaborating a justification for it is actually pretty difficult to do in the media, as we saw with John Taffer of yeah. uh, Bar Rescue fame. Because the, like John Taffer apologized for his wording, but he should be apologizing for what he was saying about how you need to use f like coercion to get people to labor in this country um and the yeah. brutality of that. It wasn't that you it wasn't the metaphor really. People like you could like that it was that you were uh, uh, so uh, out with your chest in defense of the dynamic that you were defining with that metaphor. Um, I exactly no. I mean, the coercion is is so is so true, and I think someone like Taffer would understand that because like that's how he makes his bread and butter. Um, Taffer, who got hundred thousand dollars or so of uh, people, you know, people who don't know, it's the bar rescue asshole, the guy who yeah. goes in and like yells at people. Um, <laughs> about why yeah. their bar sucks and oftentimes the bar suck but anyways um taffer's like one guy but honestly he's just a sort of like a dumbass on the on the bottom of the uh totem pole there right yeah of course real guys the guys who get it like the capitals at the very top they'll tell you this right um that they will accept temporary um reductions in profits to avoid full employment and it goes back to the coercion that you're talking about um, but they don't want uh, a situation where they have to compete for workers because it puts them at a disadvantage, right? Typically, we're at a disadvantage because we all know what happens to us when we get fired. Things get desperate. They get uncertain. They're dangerous. We have no support system, right? As much as we do, it's extremely limited and it's rigged against us, right? Capitalists prefer that to be the dynamic. They don't like the other side of it where they have to be nice to their employees, Make sure that none of their employees quit. Dude. Make sure that when their employees ask for a raise, um, you know, they, they don't want to have a situation where an employee asks for a raise. You have to give it to them, right? That's the, the dynamic that we're seeing right now. And there's a lot of weird economic factors that I've created the conditions for, but that's why there's this, this pushback. Have you seen these articles? It's impacting us. Restaurant interviewees and new hires ghosting Bay Area employers. How many times have you applied to a job and never got a response? <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's just, it's amazing. And you see what I'm saying? It's like, it's a one for one, the dynamic shifts and it's really, a, a, it's not beneficial for them. And again, like we, I opened up the segment being like, oh, this doesn't make sense, right? Why are they foregoing profits? Why are they creating a, a crisis like this when there's another option? It's because it it is in their interest to, as absurd as it might sound, to accept lower profits, you know, temporarily, as long as it doesn't create a kind of permanent or even just a long enough lasting dynamic where people can get wage gains, improve working conditions and things like that. Exactly. That's the, that's the kind of next level um, game that they're playing that I think, I don't know. No. This is the kind of thing why it's worthwhile to read these things and understand how they think um, instead of thinking that everything is so simple. Sometimes. That's the little thing where you hear like libertarians talk about the sanctity of contracts and how people wouldn't get into them if it wasn't rational for everybody. And it's like, you start to make that a little bit even on those ledgers in terms of who needs to sign and who could walk away from that table. Uh, then all of a sudden, uh, it, it becomes a little bit different. Like it's not, it's, yeah. Yeah, Ugh. yeah. that's capitalism for you. But anyway, how many, um, how much force are you, are you willing to 
I'm not going to make fun of Destiny. How much force are you willing to do to get to see your uh, program implemented? Like, well, I don't know. I'm not going to, like, in the middle of a pandemic, fuck uh, 35 million people. It's, yeah, exactly. It's it's pretty nasty. And look, again, Biden's doing it, but so is Trump. And, and the thing is, like, this is big bourgeoisie shit. Like, this is, like, beyond uh, even these kind of characters and you need to understand like the fundamental nature of the state instead of fixating so much on personality. This yeah, the, right? and also this is why technocracy like the uh, like the Ezra Klein stuff is all bullshit. Like this yes, is all about absolutely. force and power and coercion and control. These people inherited the uh heights that they sit in right now from the worst fucking like slave drivers and <laughs> financiers of slave drivers like and and they and that's history. That's just history for you. Mm -hmm. I don't know when that stopped because this is exactly it. What's happening right now is exactly what I would expect, uh, given the inheritances these powerful people have. Yeah. Um, you know, exactly. I think well, we'll have to save Bill Gates to, uh, for the yeah, patrons. We'll, we got to do Bill Gates in the post game. Um, there's some, I have a fun Alex Jones sound drop. I don't know if you've seen it yet. I'll send, I'll send no. it to you. Um, Hopefully that doesn't get us into trouble. Um, plus, we'll be taking people's questions in in the Discord and a couple more stories. Um, so join us on the other side of patreon.com slash left reckoning. We really appreciate all of y'all. Feel free to reach out anytime. I'm really feeling after this conversation that we might need to get a good guest on to talk about Fed policy to folks. I think actually demystifying these things could be really helpful for a lot of socialists and leftists. Yeah, because I mean, I think... Just like we have the leftist case for all sorts of topics, there's a lot of interest in the Fed, and it isn't a friend of the left, for instance. And so but you also have to understand what it is, too. Yes. Because like there's a lot of criticism about it that people think just because it's a criticism of the Federal Reserve means that it's progressive or good. And as you see with Bitcoin, that's not really the case. Yeah, either. Or gold bugs, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, folks, uh, left reckoning patrons, we will see you uh, about. 10, 15, well, let's say 15, 20 minutes. Uh, peace out, folks. Thanks for joining us. And hit subscribe. <laughs>